Well, okay, so we'll, uh, we'll get started now. So, welcome to this, the latest in the series of Spaceport Frontiers lectures. You have noticed that I'm not David Alexander. He is <laughs> doing important things somewhere else and has asked me to step in for the evening. Uh, my name is Steve Bradshaw. I'm one of the professors in the Physics and Astronomy Department. So it's my, my pleasure to welcome you all this evening. And actually, my pleasure as well to welcome uh, some, a group of people who have come from quite far afield. We have a group of high school students from Scotland in the audience today. They've got a space to give them a So these, these students have basically been, been chosen uh, in, a, in a competition to, to come to Houston and, and spend some time here getting immersed in sort of space related activities. We're delighted to have you here and hope, hope that you're having a great time. So now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening and I've been told to be brief. So all I'm going to say is that it is uh, fantastic to welcome Dr. Jim Green this evening. He has had a very long and distinguished career at NASA which you can read about online uh, if you so desire. He is the uh, Director of Planetary Science at NASA headquarters at the moment and he is going to speak to us this evening about using shadows to shed new light, uh, which I'm sure he will shed new light on for us now. So, welcome, Dr. Thank you very much, Stephen. It's really a delight to be here for the uh, Frontier Lecture Series. And uh, tonight, it's all about how we use shadows to really do some new and exciting science. And the importance they play in that science will be unmistakable by the, by the end of this uh, 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 little um, uh, lecture. Uh, what's critical to remember is that, what, we, what are we talking about in terms of shadows? A bright light between you and, and that light, something moves in front of it, creates a shadow. And so we have actually a number of names for these things. Eclipses, uh, occultations, trances. And over the last year, those three techniques producing shadows of one object moving in front of another have been used in an enormous number of ways. All the way from you know, the spectacular uh, eclipse here in America uh, to finding new planets around other stars. So uh, tonight I'm going to talk about uh, uh, shadows in several areas. One, we'll concentrate a little bit on the great solar eclipse of 2017 that happened in August. Then we'll also talk about uh, how shadows are used in science in our solar system. And I'll give you a couple current examples that occurred over this last year. And then eclipses in other solar systems and how we're using that information to interpret those observations. Now in many cases, these shadows lead us to a set of observations that we then follow up and gain more insight. And so in many ways, it's just the start of some of the science that we're doing. Now, I hope uh, everyone had the opportunity to participate in some way in the Great American Eclipse. Perhaps even the other students that uh, came from such a long uh, way at least uh, have heard about it. But this was an enormous event. On August uh, 21st, we had a total solar eclipse that cut across the country. 14 states were involved. 154 million Americans, actually adults, watched the eclipse. 20 million it's believed traveled to the eclipse region to be able to watch the eclipse. And 61 million Americans, adults, uh, viewed uh, the eclipse uh, by other means, either on TV or over the internet. And that results in about 88% of the adult population of America had some sort of eclipse experience. It was just such a phenomenal opportunity for Americans to really participate in a really great event. Well, this is not an unusual event. It happens all the time. You know, on the order of um, 
uh, not necessarily every month, but um, uh, quite frequent. You sometimes have to travel great distances to be able to uh, see one. And of course, um, uh, the, uh, the next one in America is in 2024, in, in the April time frame. Now what we did in this eclipse, even though eclipses are actually fairly common, is we actually did a lot of really new and exciting science. And uh, it's uh, you know, sometimes hard to imagine, uh, haven't we done everything that we need to do in eclipses? But we always find new and exciting ways to do some new science. So here's one of the first observations that NASA did. NASA actually had a plane off the coast of Oregon uh, observing during the eclipse time period. And indeed, you can see the, uh, the eclipse in the corner. And it really tested a variety of instruments. Uh, uh, looking at faint light and looking at uh, uh, the uh, lower corona. Uh, uh, other, other, others were actually looking down at the shadow. This is a speed up version um, of uh, uh, the shadow racing across the clouds as uh, actually the plane was um, uh, uh, in motion and making the observations, uh, testing those instruments. And it's a, it's a pretty, pretty spectacular view from that perspective. Another set of experiments that were done were actually looking at the sun, looking at what the corona looks like. This is the uh, extended atmosphere of the sun uh, during this occultation because we can actually see that uh, in great detail. Uh, this is actually an image from um, SOHO for which we actually have um, a coronagraph, it's called, that blots out the sunlight and then looks at scattered light all the way around the sun, and you can see some of these really great features uh, that um, are uh, uh, participate in coronal mass ejections and in a variety of other events that we know so well. The problem is this is some of the best techniques we've ever done from space, and yet we really are missing an enormous amount about the corona. And so here is uh, actually the, uh, an eclipse picture uh, that fills that area in that some of our space observations don't have the opportunity to see. So during the eclipse, it enables us for the very first time to be able to look at the lower corona, look at the structure of these hot gases that are um, in, the, in the lower atmosphere of the sun that eventually, uh, um, some of which are trapped on magnetic fields, some of which are uh, participating in the outgassing of the sun that we call the solar wind. Uh, reconnection events occur and, and huge pieces of the atmosphere blow off and go into space. And so understanding some of these coronal dynamics are extremely important. So one of the sets of activities that these scientists did indeed was start with the coronal emissions that we can see from spacecraft and then begin to model that in terms of its magnetic field structure. And then, because the sun spins on its axis, try to predict what kind of brightness distribution we would see, and then, during the eclipse, look at the difference between what was predicted from our massive computer models to then what we actually observe. And so here's the comparison. And uh, for uh, the plasma physicists in the crowd, the real set of observations are in the lower panel. And so actually we're getting really pretty good in terms of uh, understanding a lot of the dynamics of the sun, and uh, this clearly demonstrates we're making great progress in this area. So solar physics had enormous benefit in terms of what we could do uh, during these eclipses. So in the shadow of the moon, we could actually look at that lower corona and uh, uh, validate a lot of our models that we couldn't have done otherwise. But there was other activities that we did. Along the eclipse path, there were 57 balloons that were launched. These balloons went up to altitudes of greater than 100,000 feet. That's above 20 kilometers. And they were designed to have a basically an imager on a GoPro-like system that'll be able to look down and like the plane observation that I showed you, see the shadow come sweep across the country. 
But we, this also provided us an opportunity to do an experiment in planetary protection. What we wanted to do was put on board each of these balloons, or as many of them as we could, and it turns out instead of all 57, we got the experiment on 39 balloons. Here they are arrayed across the eclipse path. And they were uh, launched with 34 teams in 10 states. Uh, all these balloons went up to altitudes of 100,000 feet and greater. And we were asking two primary questions. We put pretty hardy bacteria on, on um, uh, little strips. And we wanted to see if that bacteria, as it went up to those altitudes, were, were to su uh, survive. So during a full solar eclipse, is the stratosphere a good Mars analog? At 20 kilometers, what is the temperature and pressure, and how does that compare to Mars? And then what kind of bacteria would we use? So the answer to the first question is, yeah, it really turns out to be a great environment. So you can see in the table, the pressure at altitude is very much like the Mars pressure that Curiosity observes. Also, uh, the UV broken up in these three bands matches really pretty well, far better than what's on the Earth in all of these areas. The ionizing radiation is a little different, although we have a magnetic field that does indeed affect uh, the environment of, our, of uh, cosmic rays and, and high energy particles uh, that can get into our atmosphere. And so that was uh, uh, considerably different than what it is on Mars. But then the temperature range is really uh, right on again. Uh, where we have very low temperatures just like the surface of Mars. So the answer to the question is, if these bacteria, this, uh, bio, human biobacteria, uh, go to high altitudes, would they survive in a Mars-like env environment? And so um, here's what we found out so far. The, uh, the uh, bacteria coupons that we created are about like a credit card. We put them on... Uh, uh, two of these uh, little metal panels. One we kept down on the ground as a control, another one that we launched individually in each of the balloons. The bacteria is uh, Penibacilla zerothermoduron, and it's really pretty hardy. We found these outside of clean rooms at uh, Kennedy Space Center. And uh, you can see where we, we position these balloons, uh, position these coupons on the gondola, and then we would launch these. Now these are elastic, uh, latex-like uh, balloons uh, under pressure, helium pressure. As they go up, uh, pressure around them uh, decreases. They get very large, uh, but they're able to expand to a, a very large size. And then at about 110, 115, uh, thousand feet, they break, come down, and, and uh, indeed uh, the gondola also enables us uh, to geolocate them. So in the upper panel, what you see is the actual track of three of these, of these uh, 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 bio-coupon uh, balloons, fitted balloons. And, and these three stay above 20 kilometers, which is our threshold to get above the ozone. This is where the ultraviolet light matches mostly of what Mars is like for at least one hour, and, and in the other case, almost uh, two hours in itself. So we've recovered about 26 of these, and we're in the process of analyzing them. And they're going to help tell us, indeed, if this kind of bacteria, which is probably on the Curiosity rover, is surviving on Mars or not. Right? And we'll actually have some observations to be able to determine that. If uh, the environment is such that it kills this uh, type of bacteria extensively, we may be able to have the arguments that we need to be able to say we can take curiosity and move it to locations where there might be special regions and we might be able to look for life. Uh, we don't know that we can do that, but this is the kind of experiment that allows us to make, to make the next set of observations uh, and help us uh, make that kind of determination. So now let's talk about using the eclipses to explore our solar system. And I want to start out with going to Saturn. Okay? Now that might be an unusual place to start out talking about shadows. But we had a, a situation for which 
we found with Cassini two extremely special places. These are moons uh, at Saturn. One's Titan and the other's Enceladus. Titan is the only body besides the Earth that has liquid on its surface. And it's not water, it's methane. And a liquid, like water, is so critical for, for life uh, because of the, the ability to um, uh, aid in metabolism, being able to eat things, break apart, get the energy, and, and, uh, and then uh, eliminate uh, waste through that. And so perhaps a liquid like liquid methane on another world could serve that purpose for a different type of life, life that we have maybe no idea of, of uh, how it's based or any aspects of it. So if there's life like we've never seen, like us, somewhere in the solar system, going to Titan is our first uh, best choice to do that. We also ran into a moon like Enceladus. This is actually a fairly small moon, about 250 kilometers in size. And in, in the four huge cracks in its southern hemisphere, geysers of water are pouring out of this particular moon. We've flown through these geysers, and we've, we've made a number of measurements. There's organic material there. There's plenty of indication that uh, it's being heated by hydrothermal vents that are in the ocean, the bottom of the ocean in Enceladus, and we now believe that uh, Enceladus, uh, underneath this icy crust, has a global ocean. And so it's a potentially a wonderful place that may, may uh, actually harbor life. And now we have a spacecraft called Cassini that wasn't really designed to be, uh, uh, have the ability uh, to uh, uh, protect any life that it might go to because on it is, is, uh, is, human, is human life. There's a human bio burden on that particular spacecraft that we didn't clean off. We had no idea that we would need to do that. And so this moved us in the direction of we need to protect these places. We need to go back and interrogate them, but we will not infect them with human life or even have that opportunity. So we need to figure out how to get rid of the spacecraft. This is the orbit of Cassini over uh, about a 10 year period. Uh, uh, it stayed in, in, uh, the, uh, in the Saturn area for 13 years. And uh, we used Titan as uh, swing bys and created huge changes in its orbit. But we recognized what we had to do to ditch the spacecraft and that is to get rid of it in this environment since we didn't have enough fuel to leave the Saturn environment actually was to plunge it into the atmosphere. And it's done in two steps. And that's what these two orbits look like. And they're tricky orbits. Uh, for instance, uh, in calculating how we would do that, our orbit dynamicist said, okay, the first thing we do is we get a gravity assist from Titan, and then that gravity assist allows us to get really close to the rings. And we want to fly just outside the F ring. Now, we want to avoid rings for the simple reason that, you know, a grain of sand hitting our spacecraft, which sometimes is moving at 10 kilometers per second or greater in, the, in, the, in these particular areas, in the wrong place, would really take the spacecraft out. So we really had to say, okay, we want to look for regions where the spacecraft would be safe. And then on another swing by a Titan, after about 20 what we call F-ring orbits, these are those outside the last ring, this F-ring, um, uh, then, um, uh, then we can jump inside the rings. And jumping inside the rings then would ensure that we could put it on an orbit and a trajectory that would then ditch the spacecraft. And so that's a total of 42 orbits, 22 inside below the rings, just above the atmosphere, in those uh, outside the F-ring. So, how did we figure out these orbits? Because we needed an eclipse to do so. Here is one of the first eclipses that we took of Saturn moving in front of the sun uh, with Cassini looking back. So all these observations are done on the night side of the planet, Saturn. And you see the rings. The rings are because the light from the sun is reflecting on the atmosphere, which reflects on the rings, which reflects back on the atmosphere, and illuminates this back area. This is our first major attempt at doing that. 
And of course, the area of interest, this particular area, then could be, we could concentrate on understanding the very small particles in this particular area to determine the safe trajectories. And when we blew that up, here's what we discovered. We discovered two new rings, okay? And one of them, the Janus Epimetheus ring, which is below the G ring, but above the F ring, is right in the wrong place, okay? This is an area where this material would have to, we'd have to plow through and we'd lose the spacecraft. So we had to be very judicious about that. And we're also quite interested in what, what's happening um, uh, just above the atmosphere because that's an area we were, gonna, we were also going to fly. And so these occultations uh, were really important. These eclipses, rather, were really important in helping us determine how we were going to do that. So here's the set of observations. Uh, you know, we laid out the rings, and so you have the distance from the center of the planet over a period of time, and each of these dots are really where the Cassini spacecraft would go right through the screen, you know, perpendicular uh, to, uh, to, this, uh, to the screen above us. And as you can see, that red line is the peak of the dust area of the Janus Epimetheus ring, okay? And then, Below that, we found that the extended F ring also had a significant amount of dust. And so that enabled us then to pick the locations between that carefully uh, selected location to fly our spacecraft through. And then, of course, when you look at the, the lower curve, the last set of blue dots off to the right in the very end is, uh, is certainly what we believe was well below uh, the D ring, that, that first ring that you have to worry about. And we were just going to have to take our chances. Now, it didn't look like much was going on there. So that may mean little bitty dust, but not very dense, you know, very sparse. That would be good. Or it could be some pretty big stuff, uh, uh, but uh, also very um, um, less dense and, and not, not observable. So we were going to have to take our chances with that. So once we decided to do that and we began to execute that, what did we learn? Well, we learned a whole series of new sciences because of, the, of these orbits. We were able to look at these moons, these very small moons uh, that are in and around the outer parts of the rings of, of um, uh, Saturn. And uh, these, these, these moons, which are shown here, we got tremendous close-ups of these. We could actually see ring material accreting uh, to, these, uh, to these bodies. As you can see, the, you know, the uh, pan looks like a, you know, a piece of ravioli, with it, you know, and, and, and it's right in an area in the A ring where the material has to cross, pan ha it, it, it's going to pick it up, and it ends up uh, uh, producing this belly band. Atlas II is quite, a, quite a, uh, um, an accumulator of uh, ring, ring material. So we had really some tremendous observations looking at the dynamics of the rings and trying to understand uh, what's happening in this particular area. Uh, and so that was pretty spectacular. We also had absolutely spectacular views of the northern and southern hemisphere of Saturn. And in the northern hemisphere, we've known about what, what's called the hexagon for a considerable length of time. There was a hint of it even with the Voyagers as it flew by. But this really gave us an opportunity to take a really good look at the, uh, uh, at the hexagon and watch it evolve over time. Now, the size of this hexagon is about two Earth diameters. You could, you know, think of two huge Earths. And this hexagon is actually uh, what we believe is a jet stream. So this is a jet stream that's set up. It, its shape, obviously, is a hexagon. It's, it's, it's a very stable shape. And in many ways, we're struggling with trying to understand this. Uh, and and it's, uh, it's requiring uh, some really sophisticated uh, magnetohydrodynamic modeling to be able to try to uh, uh, predict the shape. What's also pretty spectacular is right over the pole, which is this enormous um, uh, hurricane. And you can see, based on the sunlight, uh, you know, that these clouds uh, uh, raise well above the, the normal cloud deck. And we can actually watch and see the dynamics that are going on here. And so a lot of Saturn uh, uh, atmospheric circulation patterns are being observed and really noted. 
mean, it's really been uh, pretty spectacular. Now, we got pretty good at, at, uh, at these kind of eclipses, and, and this one, as you can see, is so much different than the previous one. The first one I showed you was indeed the very first time we did that. This one we did just for the fun of it, the inspiration of it. It has a wonderful configuration of the planets, Mars, Venus, and if you look, you know, they're each little bitty dots that are sitting there that are so far away. Uh, Saturn itself is at, at 10 astronomical units we're, uh, away from the sun, where the Earth is at one astronomical unit, okay? Mars is like one and a half astronomical unit. And when we uh, uh, spent time doing this uh, long, long term exposure, uh, we can actually see the Earth and the moon. So it's, it's, it's really a, a, a spectacular set of observations. So this set us up for the finale. We were confident that we could fly through these areas. As we flew through uh, the area below the rings, uh, we discovered uh, only a few very small particles, and then that enabled us to make the 22 trajectories through that. The two sets of orbits orbiting outside the rings enabled us to get the mass of the planet plus the rings, and when we took the 22 orbits, Below the rings, just above the atmosphere, we can get the mass of the planet, and therefore when we subtract the two, we can get the mass of the rings. And the current the theories are, if the rings are fairly massive, you know, like, uh, like some of these small moons all ground up and, 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 and contributing to the rings, then they may be very old, if there's not a lot of mass in the rings, they may be very young. And we're in the process of completing that analysis, uh, but it looks like uh, the rings are pretty old. So um, here is the last image uh, that Cassini took. It's actually a mosaic. It's uh, several images that are stitched together. It's almost in eclipse, and it's, uh, it goes right over the polar cap and then enters um, the atmosphere at uh, 10 degrees, as you saw in that earlier uh, simulation. So once again, this whole mission was facilitated in its end by using uh, the eclipse technique to understand uh, what the possibilities are for us to be able to make new science happen and, and do it in a way that we were in control. Another spacecraft, New Horizons, flew by Pluto a couple years ago. Now, before it did that, uh, we actually had a number of occultations. And this is where Pluto moves in front of us in a star, okay? And blots out the light of the star. So in the shadow of that star, reaching all the way back to Earth, you can see in this lower panel, here's, here's the distant star off to the right, and there's Pluto's shadow. And then you can see in the left, lower left, you can see the size of what that shadow would be. And then uh, it's sweeping across the Earth at about uh, 53,000 miles per hour. Uh, and as you can see, uh, there's, there's not much land in the area. In fact, it's, it, it was, uh, the center of it was uh, completely over water. The only way we could do that is through observations with a plane. And Sophia is the perfect uh, tool to use. It's got, you know, a, it's a 747 with a hole in the side and a beautiful telescope that allows us to stare at the star and watch Pluto move in front of it and be, be, allow us to analyze then the shadow. Here's the observations from that flight in 2011. And uh, the blue line is actually what we would expect to see if Pluto was just a hard rock, okay? So what would happen is um, uh, the light would be immediately blotted, would go straight down, and then come to a, a you know, the, the, um, uh, what we call the noise level of the instrument, go straight up and then back um, at, at a steady level as we observe the star. <clears throat> but as you can see, that is not what happened. The actual light began to dim well before the star actually was being occulted by the surface. And so that's because it has an atmosphere. And then at the very center, 
that star is illuminating the entire atmosphere, producing a beautiful little ring, giving us a little additional flash because the atmosphere is bending those waves just in the right way to come to Earth. And that gives us a peak. This enabled us really to study the atmosphere of, of Pluto before New Horizons got there and allowed us then the process of being able to plan on how to observe it. Now, of course, here's the beautiful Pluto. Uh, this is actually uh, in enhanced light, but pretty close to, to visible. Uh, what we see are uh, some unbelievable different regions, you know, the heart, uh, region is um, is actually a, a nitrogen ice, methane ice, and carbon monoxide ice. Uh, we also see methane snows in the uh, northern hemisphere, and and now there's a region of dark red material streaking over over a part of it that are called tholins. These are complex compounds that are made up of carbon and hydrogen. Uh, rearranged, not like methane, but more like ethylene and uh, acetane and a number of other things. And it's because of the breakup of the material that we see, and that must be occurring in the atmosphere. Uh, well, New Horizons did what we expected it to do, and indeed, knowing that there was an atmosphere there, its trajectory was planned such that another eclipse would occur with Pluto moving in front of our own sun, lighting up that atmosphere, and indeed, uh, we, could see, we could see that, uh, that eclipse. And that was very important because we could also target certain areas and look at the atmosphere in great detail. And we saw enormous amount of structure in that atmosphere. And uh, as we look at the atmospheric components and understand what happens to them over time, then in reality, uh, we recognize there's what we call methane cycle. And that methane is uh, in the atmosphere. It gets broken up by ultraviolet light. It also gets broken up by the solar wind, since Pluto doesn't have a magnetic field. Uh, it creates acetylene and ethylene, and then that also recombines into much heavier molecules that then cannot be sustained in the atmosphere, and they actually snow out and fall on the ground, and they are red. So if you were on Pluto, you could actually see red snow falling on the ground. And all this started in terms of a line of reasoning from eclipses studying Pluto, determining it had an atmosphere. When we look at it now and extend it, uh, a computer, computer uh, extended um, analysis stretching the color table. Where those dark areas are, that's where the tholins are. That's where the heavy concentration of tholins are. And so, indeed, um, uh, Pluto is so dynamic. We really, had, we really were uh, surprised. I don't think there were any scientists on the team that that, that had any inkling of how exciting. Uh, Pluto was going to be. But there's a new story I want to tell about New Horizons because it's now been targeted to a new, to uh, to a new Kuiper Belt object. That object is called MU69. This is an object that's much further uh, than Pluto. It's another uh, eight or ten astronomical units away. You know, uh, New Horizons has uh, had a small core, course trajectory, and off it goes. Now, we found that object with Hubble. And Hubble did a fabulous job, you know, looking for Kuiper Belt objects that we could get to. This is the one that, that was the most promising, and we targeted it. Its visual magnitude is what, uh, if you were an astronomer, this would be impressive because it's magnitude 27. You know, we have no telescopes on Earth that's going to see this thing. You know, it really requires the Hubble to find it. The estimated diameter, based on you know, uh, what we think these objects are like and understanding their reflectivity, therefore getting an idea based on the amount of light that we receive, how big they are, which we really don't know, but this, is a, this is a, would be the model, 
is somewhere between 20 and 40 kilometers. And so this is a much smaller object than the 2,000 kilometer Pluto. This is a building block of Pluto. If we want to know how these objects get together and create Plutos, we want to look at these building blocks. And this, would, this is just absolutely the perfect one. It's relatively dark and it's more red than Pluto on top of that. So what do we need to know? This object, when we fly by it, is going to be more than five and a half hours away, one-way light time, okay? And in a matter of 10 or 12 hours, we're going to be flying by it. We have to know exactly where it's at because we have to have everything automated on board, turn the camera, and take your images, and it better be there. If it's over here, we missed it, all right? And that analysis is going to tell us how much we can tolerate, and it's got to be in the frame somewhere, okay? And therefore, how far away do we need to be based on the uncertainty of knowing exactly where it's at? We do not know where this object is at. We got to figure out a way to, to, uh, to uh, uh, really determine where it's at. We don't know where it's at because we haven't watched it orbit the sun. We don't know its orbital period. We knew its orbital period we then could begin the calculations of where it's at. We might be several thousand kilometers off from where we think it's at. So how are we gonna, how are we gonna figure that out? Through an occultation. We found out that this summer, this object, MU69, passes in front of a star. Not once, but three different stars one right after the other. This was an occurrence not to be missed. Now, as you see, here they are, June 3rd, June, July 10th, and July 17th. These are the tracks where the shadow is going to sweep across the Earth. Now, it's not going to be in the huge shadow that we got like, like, uh, like Pluto, you know, which is the size of New Zealand you know, crossing here. This thing's going to be, you know, you know, maybe 100 kilometers in size or less as it sweeps across the Earth, going at 53,000 miles per hour, giving us an opportunity to only observe it from a telescope in a matter of seconds. Okay? So we have to be at the right place at the right time looking at this star. Okay? And these three stars, three different stars, what um, what we found out, of course, is uh, the first example is, well, we can, we can put some telescopes in um, uh, uh, South America, and we can put some in South Africa. We did that, and we got those observations. Very disappointing. It's almost like we missed it. Now, missing it is also okay, because we're actually interested in, is there debris around there? Anything that can inform us? Well, we need to go back and try it again, on the 10th, only Sophia could do this one. Only Sophia could do this one. And uh, uh, it, it made its observations, and, and in a way, it seemed to be a little disappointing also. It's very hard to see if there was an indication of that. And then we went down on the 17th of July in Patagonia. We arrayed uh, 24 telescopes along the highway. Uh, the Patagonians came out. They closed the road. The truckers blocked the wind. It was unbelievable to try to get this occultation from these telescopes. And, and here is one of the observations. And as you see, the star in the center winks at you. And that's because MU69 moved in front of it. This was perhaps the most difficult occultation we have ever attempted. But of course it was necessary because the occultation tells us about its size, tells us about its location, tells us if there's a debris field. Now that we know exactly where it's at, we can go back and take the other sets of data and bring it together and get even more observations and more understanding of this object. It turns out Five of the telescopes saw it. So here's an example of some of the data. You know, it looks pretty ratty. And then all of a sudden, bam, there it goes. 
<laughs> and it's about a second and a half to two seconds. We've got five of those. So now let's do the modeling. We can take the telescopes and exactly when they made those observations and map them to the sky and then create a model. And so here was our first attempt at the model, you know. So, hey, this might be an elongated object. That was one of the first, uh, first elements in the thinking. But then when we brought in the other data and started to look at it more closely, it turns out this is a better model. And that means this may not be one object, but two. And so it's very typical of the Kuiper Belt. This is a region of these small bodies that are well beyond Pluto. There's thousands of them, and about 30% 30, 30 of those, when we can resolve them, do indeed indicate they're binaries. So this is going to be an incredibly exciting encounter. July 1st, New Horizons is going to fly by this object, and we now have a better idea where it's at, and we know it's going to be exciting and potentially two objects to look at in detail. Are they the same? Are they different? What are their characteristics? That's what we will find out with New Horizons. Now, and we did that this year. Another one of the huge uh, opportunities that, that studying shadows enabled us to do some really important science that enable, that's actually mission enabling, uh, and we pulled that off this year. I want to talk about eclipses in other solar systems. Okay? So what happens is an object passing in front of the sun, you know, for us, it was the moon, but it covered everything. And as you can see in this illustration, smaller objects, like planets passing in front of stars, dim the light of the star. The bigger the object, the, the, the more is dimmed, more light is taken away that you see. And so over time, you get an intensity that drops. For something the size of the Earth, it's about a tenth of a percent in drop of the starlight. For something the size of Jupiter, it's about a percent. And so, it's far easier for us to find the larger objects in this, using this technique. But we have a tremendous telescope designed to do these kind of occultations, and it's called Kepler. And Kepler's been looking and staring at a patch of sky uh, for several years, and, and then it's moved to uh, different areas and, and um, uh, made more and more observations. And, and all it's designed to do is just measure the light from the stars that enter its telescope and keep measuring all the time, second after second after second after second, and then allows us to put together that light curve and look at that. That light curve tells us about its size. The length of time tells us about its orbit. Is it close to the star? Is it further away from the star? And so we can put it on a plot like this. And the brand new ones over this last year or so are arrayed across uh, in, in new dots. And the blue ones are ones that we've been accumulating now for the last several years. And, and what you see here is relative size. You know, there's the Earth. So if you've got bodies the Earth size and below, you know, so the Earth is our largest terrestrial planet, so below that line would be things like Mars, even Venus is slightly smaller than the Earth, certainly Mercury. Mercury would be really hard to find, uh, uh, but, uh, but uh, uh, we're getting down to that low. But then there's this other region, this region, you know, our next big body in our solar system is Neptune, but you can look at all these bodies that are found. That, that are between Earth size and Neptune size, okay? And they're all over the place. We call these super-Earths. And the more we study them, the more we recognize that they are compositionally very special. Now, Kepler data that I showed you there can be translated in another way, and that is in, indeed in terms of that other dimension, which is size. So this is where the excursion of the light from each of um, these uh, transits are, that are occurring tells us about its size. And, and when we normalize everything, here is the distribution. And you can see Mars-like objects are not very many of those. Earth size, that, that's reasonable, but there are, there are bodies in other solar systems 
for which the more numerous planets are super Earths or mini Neptunes. Okay? Those are planets we don't have in our solar system, and yet they seem to be the most populous planet in, around other uh, stars. You know, we thought maybe, what about big Jupiters? Why, why isn't Jupiter, you know, everywhere? And as you can see, Jupiter-sized planets are about as common as Earth-sized planets. It's really, really exciting then for us to begin using that to then do other analysis and kind of look at, uh, you know, what's the density of these bodies, these super-Earths. And we're seeing a classification for which the ability to get a body that's a, that's a, a rocky planet uh, uh, that is a, a, at a certain size, but a different density than what we're typically used to, requires that we add an enormous amount of water. And so we believe there are a number of these planets that, we, that are super Earths that are ocean dominated. Uh, also, we believe uh, we, can, we can easily see in the data set super Earths that are largely rocky. Uh, there may be some limit to this size. You know, some of the thinking is that when planets get to be 10 times or 15 times the mass of the Earth, they're big enough to accumulate then more gas in, the for, in their early formation that they actually are more like gas giants. And what may be on the inside of gas giants are several Earth mass bodies. So that's really exciting. Now, this year, uh, another set of observations came in. These are transit observations from a spacecraft called Spitzer. And as you can see, uh, there's the excursions. And they're very different, and this is why they're labeled A, B, C, D, and this is what the model tells us must be happening, as you can see in the upper panel. And we observed this system for a number of, uh, for a number of days. This happened this year. <coughs> this was really a tremendously exciting set of discoveries, because from this data, we can tell a lot about these planets. And here's what we found out. This system is called TRAPPIST-1. It's a dwarf star, a, red, a, a, a small dwarf star, very different than our sun, not very luminous, uh, but it's 39 light years away. It is around the corner, okay? That sounds like a long, 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 long distance, but you know, talking to astronomers, you know, it's like our local neighborhood. Now, what's really great about this is, indeed, there are several of these planets in what we would call the habitable zone, a region for which the light from the star is such that on these bodies, water could exist in three forms. It's not too hot, where, where, where it would only be vapor. It's not too cold, where it would only be ice. But in this particular area, in the habitable zone, you could have water, vapor, and um, the solid, ice. And that's why we call it the habitable zone. So in February, an announcement came out that we found, that found uh, seven terrestrial-sized uh, bodies. Uh, these are all really big bodies. They're Earth-sized and slightly smaller. And it generated an enormous amount of excitement. Well, we've studied this system a little more. And, um, uh, and that's what eclipses do. It draws our attention to these and allows us to then take a really good look at them and study them. And we found out a couple different things. This dwarf star is really active. It has huge coronal mass ejections, a significant solar wind, a lot of flares, and is hammering these planets. Okay? Not only that, because this star is also much smaller in mass in the, than our own sun, you know, maybe, maybe 100 or 120 Jupiter masses, okay, in size, in, in terms of mass, rather. Uh, these bodies are all very close to the star, and therefore, like the Galilean moons, as you see in the upper panel, of Jupiter and Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, those are all tidally locked, just like our moon, because they're close to the planet. 
then these planets appear to be tidally locked to the star. So although they're in the habitable zone, it's tough for us to think about how habitable they might be because they're tidally locked, meaning one face always points to the sun, okay? And they're being hammered by the solar wind. So extreme, it's far different, uh, far, far more extensive than, than our own sun does. And as you can see, it's a much smaller system when you compare it to our own. All that could fit inside the orbit of Mercury. And Mercury is nearly tidally locked. But here's the really great discovery. Okay? This star, 39 light years away, when it collapsed and was created, it also had material to create seven terrestrial planets. That tells us our area of the galaxy is full of planet-making material. That tells us that we have a better chance of finding habitable planets closer to our star than perhaps we thought in the past. And that's done from understanding and following the trail that eclipses lead us. What can follow up Trappist and other nearby planets, of course, is JWST. JWST has uh, been down in the big chamber here at JSC, uh, just came out of that. It's on its way uh, to uh, being completed and will be launched in early 2019. And so it's a, a tremendous telescope that allows us to follow up on a lot of these discoveries. So what's the next step in, planet, in planetary analysis? It's really all about going after these planets and looking at their atmosphere. So how do we do that? Here are our three planets, uh, Mercury, I'm sorry, Mars, Earth, and Venus. You can see you get an indication of what is in the atmosphere. Of course, the carbon dioxide signature is strong. Uh, if you follow down uh, the water in the ozone signature of Earth, you, you can really get a very rich spectrum that indicates uh, the potential for life uh, uh, from, from making atmospheric measurements uh, like our own Earth. And, uh, and so how are we going to approach that? Well, we're going to look for these atmospheres. And to do that, we're going to talk about shadows. And here's a Venus transit, June the 5th, 2012. Uh, for those that may have observed it, you know, Venus crossed the surface of the sun. And uh, what we saw, this little ring of light, is the atmosphere. Once again, just like Pluto, the, lights up the atmosphere with that sunlight, uh, just like uh, some of the things that we saw with Cassini. Uh, this transit technique was, uh, was first used in 1761 uh, by a, a, um, uh, an astronomer, I believe he was a Polish astronomer, and um, not, not, many, not many scientists saw this uh, transit, 176 people. But indeed, he was able to see an atmosphere of a planet for the very first time. You know, we thought these were only, you know, rocky bodies, and now we're seeing atmospheres. And, and uh, that's, that's been known now for several hundred years. The next step is to block the light of the stars and look for the planets and look at their atmospheres, which will be illuminated by the light from those stars. And that, indeed, is our next step. And it, it, it will revolutionize uh, looking for potentially Earth-like planets in the future, and it will be done in the shade of the stars. Thank you very much. Hey, well, thank you very much, and uh, we have time well. for some questions. Uh, you may have to speak up. I'm going to see if I can identify a working microphone. But if anyone... I can repeat them. Uh, yeah, actually, if you can repeat the questions, that would be great. Yeah, go ahead, right there. Uh, Dr. Brady, can you talk about the Parker mission and what you're doing to prepare for that? Yeah, so there's a mission called uh, Parker Solar Probe. 
And the question was, uh, what is that all about? Uh, it's a, actually a solar probe. It's, a, it's actually a mission to the sun. Now, when we look at the sun and we see this extensive corona, uh, we, we know that a lot of the upper atmosphere of the sun is trapped on these magnetic field lines. But yet, as you move further back, you actually feel the wind of the sun. The sun constantly outgasses in all directions. So how do you go from an area where most of that hot gas is trapped in the magnetic field to an area where there's gases that are flowing away from the sun in all directions? And that's what Solar Parker Probe is going to probe. It's going to fly, uh, it will have several gravity assists around our uh, uh, Venus, as an example, as, a, as it gets to really close to the sun, we'll get to 10 solar radii. And, and that's an area where we believe uh, this magnetic field structure uh, changes into a, a, a radial solar wind uh, structure and, and facilitates the, uh, the outgassing that we see, and we call that the solar wind. So we're really going to go uh, to an area that's incredibly hot. So this is a whole variety of new technologies that are being developed to be able to do that, and it's, it's doing really well. It's, it's on track to be launched in another year or so. Couple of years actually. Uh, yes. This, this last uh, eclipse, which my wife and I saw in the Princeton Green Tunnel, we, I haven't done the, I didn't check out the, the story yet, but we saw the one in Carl Harrell also in 1991. It seemed to, I don't know how I'm asking you, was the, was the, uh, was more of the sun blocked out? Yeah, good question. So the question is, um, uh, this gentleman has seen a number of eclipses, and, and this one uh, may have blocked out more sun than the other. And it turns out it didn't. Um, uh, it, it may be small variations, but the, the large differences you may see is dependent upon where the sun is in the solar cycle. So during the time when the sun has a few sunspots, the corona is much reduced. And during the time there's a lot of sunspots, it's much more extensive. So that could give the impression that you know, you're looking at a huge sun near solar maximum and a, and, a, and, a, and a smaller sun during solar minimum, and that's an optical illusion. It's really all about the extent of the corona. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, the, the moon also is a different distance. The moon is a, indeed at different distances. So I'd have to, okay, so the question is, indeed, uh, the moon is in an elliptical orbit, and so sometimes it's closer to the Earth than at other times. And when you compare them, we'd have to look and see which one is, is uh, closer to the Earth. So what happens when it's closer to the Earth is, indeed, you have a, a, a bigger range, a bigger distance where you could view totality. And, indeed, it, it you know, clips a little bit of the lower corona. But it's, uh, it's still negligible in terms of the difference between that and what you really see, which is the corona. Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned NASA and what Cassini crashing into the moons of Titan, or excuse the moons of Saturn. But didn't the uh, Huygens probe crash into Titan? Yeah, so we dropped the Huygens probe. Yeah. But that went through a whole variety of processes to, uh, to be clean, to be able to do that. So uh, we knew what we were, what what may be there. We, there was some indication, although we didn't, we hadn't seen the, the, the lakes at all when the Voyagers flew by. But it seemed to be some indication there might be a significant amount of methane, and maybe liquid methane, based on the temperature that we thought it was at. And so, um, with that in mind, you know, you you have to design your mission such that it can handle those kind of extremes and, and be mindful of of, of uh, not not uh, uh, taking huge amount of human uh, uh, bio burden on each of these missions as you go through them. Thank you. There's another question over here? Yes, sir. I was just going to mention that uh, when my, my youngest son was born, which and he's 25 years old, mm -hmm. there was an annular eclipse. Mm -hmm. that, that's really a, a situation where, where the moon is, is more distant. Correct. And so an annular Yeah. So indeed, there are times uh, where the sun is further and that's an, 
that's, that's a, what we call an annular eclipse. And that's when the moon doesn't completely cover the entire surface. That means uh, the shadow actually ends before it actually touches the ground. Uh, but in that case, we were talking about, is it bigger rather than smaller? <clears throat> is the moon bigger rather than smaller? So we were talking about the other end. Yes. Uh, can you explain how that works? Is it actually placing an object uh, at some distance to, to form an eclipse, an artificial? Yep, that's, so, as you see, um, a star shape is really about blocking that star's light. And uh, uh, based on uh, the modeling, uh, the, the, what has to happen is not only a disk, but, but these funny little fans that stick up all around it eliminates a stray light that, that does occur, and it has to be a significant distance away from the spacecraft itself. And as you can see in this example, you know, uh, separation distance, 30,000 to 50,000 kilometers. I mean, that's, that's enormous. So these two spacecraft, literally the star shape and the, and the telescope itself, have to operate independently and then yet line up to be able to block a star's light out and then once you see that, then have enough um, uh, intensity uh, lighting up uh, a planet's atmosphere. The light, reflected light from the planet, is a billion times typically less than the star itself. So you've got to get rid of the starlight, and, uh, and you've got to have a big enough telescope where you can actually see the light from the planet. So this is really a challenging mission. But it is indeed the, another big step for us to be able to then look at the atmosphere and then make comparisons between that and the atmospheres of our own planets and our own solar system so that we can understand um, if they're habitable or not. Yeah. Yes, sir? And we'll go over here. Looking at the uh, Trappist and the uh, occupation of, those areas of that star, um, by those multiple planets. Um, and looking at the dip in the light intensity of the star as, as the transit occurs, uh, that gives you certain assumptions of, about the size and uh, the mass of the planet that, that we see for Trappist. But, but that, does that assume that that transit is occurring across the equatorial plane of the star. How do you know that that solar system is not tilted a bit, such as the transits happen, you know, at the, at the lower edge? Uh, and so that would completely throw off the, uh, the size and mass estimates of the planet. What do you think about that? Yeah, so indeed, every transit that we look at, we have to determine the plane of the planets, okay? And so, um, they're going to come in a variety of planes. And in fact, there are 30% of the stars that we see that may have planets in it. We'll, we'll never see them because their, their orbit plane may be per perpendicular to our observation, never transit. So there's a variety of calculations that are done based on the transiting and multiple observations of the transiting that actually can, can infer what that inclination is. And it can range all over the place, just so long as those planets cross the disk. And so um, uh, that indeed affects um, uh, uh, you know, the size and distance estimates uh, based on those occultations. So all that has to uh, be taken into account to get, to get an accurate size. Uh, for mass, you have to go back and verify it with other telescopes to determine how the star may wobble as it moves through space based on the mass of the planets that are tugging and pulling it as they, as they orbit it. And that can be done through uh, uh, what's called a, a radial velocity measurement. And you can see, uh, you can see the, the light from the star shifting a little bit based on its motion. And then that gives it away in terms of the fact that it's wobbling based on the planets and then you can calculate their mass. So that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's what you have to do to follow up on the eclipses. Yes, sir. For the balloon experiment you mentioned, creating eclipses, perfect eclipses, why did that need to be, maybe I missed it, but why did that need to be during eclipses, not just at night? 
They were launching 57 balloons and got the FAA approval to do it. And uh, it was a ride of an opportunity. It was a ride of a lifetime to get, to, to get uh, 37 balloons uh, outfitted. And, uh, and, and then it also enabled us to engage a whole variety of student population to not only learn about the experiment, but be, be, be able to deploy it uh, and um, follow the procedures of hunting the balloon down and recovering it and then uh, recording you know, whether, whether um, you know, um, some of these ended up, one ended up in a cow pot, so you can't use that one, you know, and then others were drugged on the ground, and, you know, and, and so uh, whether the experiment was compromised or not. So in, in, instead of a full 30 some, we got, we, got, um, uh, we got about 26 or 27 of them. The point being, Gary, do you think that's what well, it was a right of an opportunity, so we, did, we used the balloons because it was a right of an opportunity and it enabled us to get to a location where we had a Mars analog. And we could do a whole bunch of them, which would do nothing but improve our statistics. So it's not like a single ride where everything's bet on it. We had an array across the country. But I guess it, would that have worked just at night? Would that have worked at night? So during the solution we expected that No. And the reason why is at night, uh, the ultraviolet light would be blocked. And we believe the ultraviolet light is, is, a, is a potential killer for these microbes. Yeah. So we want to do it during the day. And then uh, we want to be able to get it up to an altitude above the ozone so that the ultraviolet light um, uh, would indeed be one of those, uh, one of those major parameters uh, that we look at. So when we bring those coupons back, you know, we have a control and we see, we see the mortality rate and then we get an estimate based on its exposure and its path. So we also, could, also can get its path and then we know how long and what the trajectory is. And as you can see, there's all kinds of variations in that. Some were up one hour, some were up more than that, two hours and more. And so then that also adds into the statistics of it. So it's a great opportunity it's a right of an opportunity that allows us to get an array of measurements that, that uh, uh, all in the same context. And that's, that's very important. And, and that's, that's being analyzed right now. So uh, the, the architecture of why, why and how we get eclipse really uh, starts with um, understanding the plane of the moon. And the plane of the moon is actually cocked a few degrees. Right. And so then as, as we move around that sun, then, then that plane allows it to change orientation relative to the sun. And you've got to be at the right place you know, at one of these nodes that allow them the sunlight to shine on the Earth. And then as the Earth spins, that's why you have different locations for the eclipse. But indeed, um, every new moon, um, you know, if you could see the moon in the middle of the day, passes above the, above the sun or below the sun, you know, because that's, that's where it's at in its, in its uh, slightly tipped orbit. Ah, so you're talking, okay, so your question may be relative to a spacecraft yeah. using the moon for eclipses. Well, indeed, a spacecraft that observe the sun see the moon pass in front of it all the time, okay? But it's, um, uh, I don't believe in all the years that we've been up there, we've actually caught the right example where the moon covers the sun from a spacecraft perspective and created an eclipse. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know of any observation we've taken from any of our solar observers that, 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 uh, that do that. Yes, sir. I'm going to get back to my, uh, my uh, Kentucky experience. I wish I'd done my homework in advance because I forgot all about being able to see Mercury. 
Yeah. And I wish I had known where to look. Yeah. I'm sure I saw it, but I don't know. It may not be Mercury, it may be Venus. Could, be, could have been behind us. Yeah. Do you know where it was? Yeah. So relative to the planets during the eclipse, we know where the planets are. So during the eclipse, the last one in particular, Venus was off to the right. Yes, I remember that. Okay. Yeah, that that just day. popped right out. Yeah. That was really obvious. Mercury was a little harder to see. It was off to the left. And Mars was a little further away from and, that. And, and, and was Mercury like... Yeah. Was it like uh, pretty far away at the time? That's a good question. Because, because they were really, really close. No, it wasn't really close to the sun. Yeah, it, was, it wasn't really close to the sun. It was, um, Mercury was, um, was indeed um, well away from the sun that you could have seen it if you knew where to look. You needed to be in the totality. You needed to be in the area of totality. Um, I was, uh, uh, this was actually my, uh, my, my first uh, total eclipse. And I was in uh, Idaho. Uh, I was in Idaho Falls. And uh, it was one of the NASA broadcast places. Uh, NASA broadcasted from like 10 locations along the eclipse path. And so they, they would go from place to place to place during totality. And we would report on what we saw and what was going on. And, and, and I was pretty excited because it was first one. So it got really dark. It was just fantastic. And Venus po popped out. It was great. And then the street lights turned on. <laughs> you know, had I really thought about that, I would not have been anywhere near a town. You know, I would have been out in the country somewhere. <laughs> but uh, the, the hazards of, uh, you know, your first eclipse. <laughs> All right. Well, um, we haven't yet fed our speaker. And he's been working very hard all day. Um, so I'd like to thank Dr. Ian again. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.